Okay, so thank you very much. There will be three talks, I guess, about uh, switching antiretroviral therapy. So I will try not to cover everything and, and leave. So I will focus on the clinical and, and some clinical and resistance considerations uh, regarding switching antiretroviral therapy. So these are my disclosures. Again, I received grants from V, MSD, and Gilead. I was involved in advisory boards from these three companies, and unfortunately, I don't have any patent active these days. So the first question is about why, why do we have to switch? So um, now it, it is, we have a lot of options for switching and as clinicians we can decide to switch to many different uh, drugs and drug combinations and it's become so easy and there are plenty of patients that would be candidates to switch that sometimes we do it uh, without putting a lot of thought on it. So there has to be uh, specific reasons for switching. And the first one is that perhaps we're looking for increased uh, potency. We might be willing to increase the tolerability, reach better convenience, reduce pill burden for our patients, uh, attempt to come up with treatments that are less toxic with less drug interactions, treatments that might be better in patients with comorbidities. Sometimes also it's because of pharmacy costs. It's, uh, for example, in Europe, we, in Spain, up to five years ago, we had a lot of uh, economic pressure uh, due to economic crisis that we were having and we're still having, but now it's a little bit better. So there was a lot of pressure from, from the government to reduce costs. Uh, but also, uh, uh, as we can see, there are a number of country, regional, or global program interest in switching. For example, with the recent WHO guidelines, uh, countries might just decide to switch patients who are doing relatively well on their ongoing treatments to, for example, dolutegravir based uh, treatments. And this is because the global programs, global programs find uh, benefits on, on that. So in other words, we have to switch because we think that we are offering a better treatment. Okay. However, switching might also come at a cost and, and there's a very nice uh, review, critical review from Andrew Hill and Anton Posniak and, and, and others here showing that yes, we might want to reduce uh, the pill burden. Um, um, but sometimes in order to do this, we might have to increase pill doses or number. Sometimes if we want to switch to a simpler uh, uh, regimen, we might lose biological control. We might want to prevent or reverse toxicity, but sometimes we might actually create new toxicity because we're expo exposing patients to newer drug classes, for example, like uh, patients who we know that a number of patients on INSTIs might have sleeping problems at some point, so maybe these patients were doing well uh, and we are exposing them to new, to new drugs. Sometimes toxicities might not reverse. reverse. Uh, sometimes we might also encounter unforeseen new interactions, um, etc. So for example, we want to, if we want to prevent toxicity to mother or fetus, we, for example, when we started switching or using dolutegravir in, in women with childbearing potential, we might actually encounter some, some problems there. If we switch because of costs, uh, then the market prices might change and, 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 and then maybe three months after switching, it turns out that that was not the cheapest uh, drug combination again and there's some other treatment drug combination and just, just keep switching from drugs to drugs. So, Yes, it is nice. It, it, uh, switching might confer benefits, but it also creates a number of, of, of problems. So, there has been a lot of criticism, uh, 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 positive criticism, I think, uh, saying that if we want to think about switching clinical trials, we need to consider a number of issues. So, nowadays, we, we can achieve biological non inferiority with many switches, but uh, on, on, on in isolation, it is not a benefit on its, on, on its own. In, in addition to virological non-inferiority, we need to seek uh, some uh, additionally anticipated uh, uh, benefits that are clinically relevant to most uh, uh, participants. We need to make sure, or we need to at least think or, or be careful of not exposing patients who are doing well to treatments that, that might expose them to virological 
failure. And to some extent, that happened during the monotherapy studies. Uh, there were a number of reasons, although it is highly debated, uh, but there were a number of reasons to think that those were kind of, or at least some clinicians or researchers thought that those were very risky uh, clinical studies. Uh, but at the same time, if we don't try, sometimes we will never, we will never learn. But, but uh, you know, we need to really be careful before doing really uh, too aggressive uh, approaches. And, um, large switch toxicity studies should be preceded by small proof of concept studies. And if we want to assess uh, the antiviral potency of, of treatments, we, that's much better done in, 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 clinical, in treatment naive patients than in, switch, uh, than in switch studies. An important consideration is that our clinical trials have to have the right duration for the predicted outcome that is actually leading uh, um, um, our, our, our own like main efficacy parameters. For example, if we're interested in, in, in lipid changes, we don't need a two-year uh, clinical study. We can find if the drugs actually exert some lipid changes in possibly 12 weeks. So, so for assessing lipid changes, we just need shorter clinical trials. However, for bone mineral density, we might require uh, longer uh, clinical trials. I need to think, uh, think about that. And, um, if it is OK if we want to set up a clinical trial in which costs are the main driving um, uh, reason why we're doing it, but we need to make sure that we're informing patients very well that that is the reason why we, so it is legitimate because and particularly in places where the money, these drugs have to be paid by someone. So it is legitimate to consider cheaper drug combinations, but then we, we need to be very open with patients and tell them that this is the reason why we're doing stuff. Okay, so I will not go <laughs> through all these different switch studies, uh, but just, like, just to show you that there are tons tons of, of, of switch studies and, and you can find any almost any any type of switch study that you can you can imagine okay I will and then the I, I will use two relatively old uh, clinical trials uh, to to uh, one that uh, so both involve a uh, raltegravir one that did in which switch the switch did not work uh, which is a switch mark study. And then I will compare it with uh, an almost identical clinical trial where the switch did work, which is the spiral study. And it is not so much as to, to, to you know, for you to remember all these data, but to, to think about which are, which might be the determinants, the clinical determinants that might, um, that might drive uh, good um, e effectiveness in, in the clinic. So the switch mark study, was a study that included uh, adults, uh, more than 18 year old adults who were on lopinavir, uh, ritonavir boosted lopinavir plus two nukes, and had undetectable viral load during at least three months. They were switched to raltegravir BAD uh, plus lopinavir placebo, and continuing the other antiretrovirals versus uh, lopinavir BAD plus placebo, raltegravir BAD plus continue uh, other antiretrovirals. And randomization was stratified on Calitra used before entry, and as you can see, it was a large study. Patients had been on lopinavir therapy for at least one year. Not everyone had suppressed viremia, so you could have like you could see that about 5%, 4 to 5% of patients still had detectable vi viremia. And about 30 to 40% of individuals included in, in, in SwitchMark 1 and SwitchMark 2 had had a history of previous virologic uh, failure as reported by the investigator. So the main endpoint was changes in lipids. At that time, of course, uh, lopinavir was uh, very bad for the, the lipids, and, and, and the main endpoint was achieved. So patients who switched to raltegravir plus antiretrovirals got much better in terms of lipids. But uh, virologically, 
they did clearly worse. So the individuals who switched to, to raltegravir did worse than those who stayed on uh, lopinavir, uh, ritonavir. There were a number of, of subgroup analysis performed in these individuals, but what could be seen at the end is that the main factor involving um, the chances of getting undetectable at week 24 was uh, whether the subject had had previous virological failure or not. If patients had had a previous virologic failure uh, and were put on raltegravir, only 76% of them became undetectable uh, versus 91% if they were put on lopinavir, showing that Previous history of virological failure, it is something that you must be aware that could put patients at risk of, of virological failure if the upcoming regimen does not have a high enough genetic, genetic barrier, okay? So in conclusions for uh, switch mark, in patients with virologic suppression on a lopinavir containing regimen, switching from lopinavir to raltegravir was associated at week 24 with greater reductions in lipid concentrations, but lower rate of HIV uh, suppression. So the results did not establish non-inferiority, and in the post-doc analysis, patients without previous virological failure were the only ones that had similar viral suppression rates in both uh, treatment groups. In comparison, the spiral study, which was done in, in more or less at the same, at the same time, a few months uh, later, it was not such a big study, but it was uh, powered enough for uh, non-inferiority. And here you had patients on two antiretrovirals plus a PI who had been undetectable for more than six months and were raltegravir naive. And uh, what was very important in this study is that median time with virologic suppression was more than six years. So in, in fact, these patients had been suppressed for a very long time. And again, they, they were randomized to switch to raltegravir or to continue with, uh, with uh, the previous uh, PI. Here, is, uh, here you can see the results for the primary efficacy analysis. And uh, in dark blue, you see the results for raltegravir, so 90% uh, suppression, absence of treatment failure in all patients. And here it was regardless of prior virological failure or suboptimal therapy and, absence of, and in, in patients with uh, absence of virological failure. So. Having had a prior, a prior, prior virologic failure is not the only uh, reason for failure, but a, a failure to a switch. But in, in this case, what happened was that patient had been suppressed, or at least the way we interpret that is that patients had been suppressed for very, very long, very long time. So time under suppression is also a factor that influences the successes on risk of success under, under a switch strategy. Again, um, uh, like in the switch mark study, switching to Raltegra here improved significantly all the lipid uh, parameters. So in conclusions, in HIV infected adults with sustained plasma uh, detectable viral load on PI containing antiretroviral therapy, switching from the PI component to Raltegra here results in non inferior efficacy and a better treatment profile. So, but that was a few years ago. Nowadays, uh, we are essentially, when we are thinking of switching therapy, we are mostly thinking of switching therapy to dolutegravir containing uh, regimens, essentially, and maybe we will be now thinking of switching therapy to new drugs like Islatravir in the future or other drugs, but here, and, and we are starting to consider dual therapy for the first time, so we are now in uh, perhaps changing and, and starting to provide dual therapy in some pati in patients, and, and was, which was, until now, it wasn't heard of. And what we've seen from the, in the previous session is that usually those dual therapies, whether they are done with PIs or with dolutegravir, they usually contain 3TC. Um, so, and we have also learned that providing um, dolutegravir as monotherapy is not a good idea because patients fail much more than with other ones. 
But then the question at the end of the day, nowadays the, 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 the most resistance considerations um, are around what to do if there is an embolism for V mutation or not. And whether the 3DC could or could not be, uh, the efficacy of 3DC could or could not be impaired in the presence of n one for v I think that here we have to separate very clearly two different situations. So one is when the patient is, uh, has a detectable viral replication, so in treatment naive patients with n one for v and in patients where we find n one for v in plasma, meaning that these are live viruses that contain m 1 for v And perhaps another consideration will be what happens when we find m 1 for v in provital DNA, which it's not necessarily interpreted in the same way. Okay, so as we said in the previous session, in many, uh, in many countries, in many regions, if there is no previous PrEP exposure, the prevalence of m one for v mutation is very rare in treatment naive patients. So less than 0.5% of our treatment naive patients will have m one for v, the m one for v mutation. The problem is that if we have one of those patients and then we put them onto virtual monotherapy, we are afraid that that patient might fail and also might accumulate mutations in the integrase gene that might blow up all the all the or the integrase uh, class. But nevertheless, in, in treatment naive patients without PrEP exposure, m one for v is very rare. However, this is, these are data from the New York City I was mentioning uh, before. Um, from a newly diagnosed patients who had been uh, exposed to PrEP at some point in their life, or compared with patients who have never used PrEP. And what you can see here is that when patients have been, up to 30% of patients who had been exposed to PrEP in the past had the m one for v mutation. Whereas m one for v was a, a very rare, extremely rare, was 2% in, in, in never PrEP users, okay? Very importantly, K65R mutation was virtually absent. It was only found in two, in four individuals who actually were not exposed to PrEP. Okay, so in PrEP users, there was no K65R mutation. So what we need to think about is that we have a treatment naive patient. The next question we need to ask is, have you been, have you used PrEP? If the answer is no, chances of m one for v are very low. If the answer is yes, then you do need a resistance test before uh, using a, a you know a, a dual 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 regimen. Okay. And uh, as of today, we should not worry much in practice about K65R mutation. Of course, the caveat is that we need to confirm this data in other regions of the world, even in the U.S. Or maybe, as I was saying, maybe in California, the data would be different. So this is just the first data that emerges. Maybe in Rotterdam, might be different. In London, might be different. We need the data, okay? But it's a, a, a less cautionary tone. So what happens in uh, when we um, use? the new integrase inhibitors as a switch um, strategy. So we know that both big tegravir and dolutegravir study, switch studies have been very successful. They have been, a lot of patients have been exposed, have been switched to either big tegravir, big tarvi, or dolutegravir without high um, rates of, of virological suppression. Then a number of uh, the, so the companies, what companies have done is they have gone back to the baseline um, samples and they have looked into the provital DNA um, and, and, and they have used next-gen sequencing tools to detect, to see if there were m one for v mutations present there or not and other NRTI mutations. And when they have looked uh, in provital DNA, they, they actually they found uh, Resistance, a significant amount of resistance mutations in provital DNA. For example, here, when they combine using historical uh, genotype, for example, using the historical genotype, 
up to 3.4 patients at any times, but up to when you combine the baseline genotype, historical, and provital, you can get up to 10% of individuals with any TAMS, 12% of individuals with any NNRTI, and 5% of individuals with m 4 v up to 11% of the individuals with uh, protease inhibitor resistance. So there's a certain amount of resistance hanging in proviral DNA in these individuals. But again, to make a long story short, such resistance virus, such, such resistant viruses did not impact the virological outcomes of the, combina of the drug combination. So if a patient has undetectable viral load and has been undetectable uh, for a while, proviral DNA is not, there's not an evidence that proviral DNA information is giving us uh, uh, clinically useful information to do anything else. Provided that we give the patients Bictegravir, Dolutegravir, any of these um, uh, potent combinations. Same thing on this uh, in the study 380. So individuals with less than 50 copies for more than three or, or six months randomized to a Dolutegravir TAF or Bictegravir TAF. Uh, huge responses again. Uh, up to 15, 20% of patients in both arms with m 1 for v mutation in proviral DNA, and that did not have an impact at all on the subsequent virological outcomes. So finding that mutation in proviral DNA in this situation is not changing anything of our clinic, clinical practice. So as a resistance uh, person, I don't like proviral DNA genotyping for clinical management. So maybe we can have that discussion with Charles. I, I, we think that, and that this is because, first of all, proviral DNA genotyping is a, has low sensitivity, so it misses more than 50% of mutations when mutations are there. But it also has low specificity. So when we detect mutations, it happens that Often those mutations are in dead viruses that will not um, eventually uh, originate virological failure. I'm not saying that this might not be useful in certain scenarios, just to, if you have many options, for example, if you want to do uh, an organ transplantation, a patient is undetectable, and you have many different options. But uh, this is a test that has not been uh, clinically validated for patient management, although it is, might be useful for re, uh, research, okay. Um, Charles was mentioning there's uh, uh, then some data from small studies um, looking at the effects of M184V mutation when patients are switched to two drug um, regimens. For example, we have the Dolulam study in which individuals were random, it was a small study where individuals were randomized uh, to dolutegravir 3 tc and out of 17 individuals who had m 1 4 v mutation at baseline, they all remain suppressed. Similar findings when you, in the Moby Deep study, when if patients are switched to boosted PI and 3 tc presence of m 1 4 v does not change uh, the effectiveness of, of, of dual therapy. And same thing with the, um, in the ARCA cohort where m 1 v did not affect the virological efficacy of 3TC-based maintenance to the R. Okay. The Dodorulam study was a small pilot single center cohort study in which patients on unstable antiretroviral therapy with HIV RNA less than 50 copies for more than 12 months, again, uh, prolonged time undetectable, with tolerability issues on current drug regimens and without any I associated resistance mutations, were switched to dolutegravir 3TC uh, QD. And uh, here's the summary of the results. So you, you, there were 27 individuals who were switched to dolutegravir 3TC. 63% of these individuals had m 184 v mutations prior to switch. 
and uh, there were no virological failures. Nevertheless, it's still a very small study. It's 27 patients, so that's why, as Sha was saying before, we need larger studies. We need to think which has, what is the best way to uh, design those studies. Similar thing for the MobyDeep study. Um, MobyDeep compared boosted PI plus 3TC relative to boosted PI alone, monotherapy. And what became clear was that even in the presence of M184V, addition of 3TC was conferring higher efficacy uh, compared with monotherapy. So whereas PI monotherapy is clearly suboptimal, when we add 3TC, there seems to be something, let's say, magical. I don't want to say the word magical because it's not magical, but there's something that's being added onto the regimen that provides, that increases uh, its safety, even in the presence of M184V. So, yes, this is a summary of a number of uh, small studies and prospective cohorts that are being developed uh, around uh, Europe and, inter and, and in the US, and essentially very little amounts of virological failure. And when there is virological failure, there is uh, no resistance so far. Okay, so we are. This is just proof of concept studies that need to be confirmed, but it seems that we are moving in the right direction. So, to end my talk, let me just say that for my first conclusion is only switch if you foresee a benefit of the patient. Of course, uh, there are two kinds of, uh, I think that John Kenneth Galbraith said that there are two kinds of forecasters, those who don't know and those who don't know that they don't know, okay? so. So, of course, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen with your patients, but we've learned some things. So, you should not be doing monotherapy. There are a number of things that we should not be doing. And if you think, if you want to switch your patients, you need to have at least a legitimate uh, expectancy that patient, that you will be providing some benefit and not just switching because you have a nicer, more modern drug that has just uh, arrived to, you, to your clinic. Uh, my conclusion would be allow at least six months of undetectable viral load, possibly with the newer regimens with, with Victarbi or with Dolotegravir, uh, triple therapy, you could allow for three months, but we rarely switch before six months in, in our clinic and we think that six months is, 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 is pretty safe. We need to make sure, we need to ensure the genetic barrier of the next regimen so the regimen to which the patients are switching to. So it could be two drugs as long as the genetic barrier of the regimen is high enough. Be careful if there's previous virological failure and resistance accumulation. Today, proviral DNA genotyping, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you that proviral DNA genotyping is not clinically validated for patient management. And I th my personal opinion, I'm very strong on that, is that it's completely useless and misleading. So you. Uh, in proviral DNA. So, whereas plasma genotyping is actually very useful and can be very useful, and particularly knowing if M24V is there or not is nowadays the main que resistance question that we have these days. But proviral DNA, don't expect proviral DNA to solve your problems. If viral load is, remains undetectable, uh, persistence of M184V perhaps will not matter. And I say perhaps, but uh, studies, uh, proper studies are needed, and this is the most risky sentence from my, my, my conclusions. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>